How's things, man? Hey, good. You know, you know, running like crazy. Archery season opened August 30th, just closed a couple days ago. Uh, and hunted an embarrassing number of days. Um, so I'm kind of tired. Rifle opens Tuesday, and I'm trying to get psyched out to head out for that. Yeah, it's kind of funny. We, you know, all we want to do is hunt more. And then when you actually get, I was thinking about that today, looking at my calendar for the year. I couldn't be more blessed at the moment. I, I never thought in a million years, this is what my hunt calendar would look like. And I thought, I wonder how many people would actually want this. Like when you actually sit down and recognize like how many days you're spending in the field and how little time at home you get in between. And my gear locker doesn't even get cleaned up between hunts anymore. Like you kind of almost, we got it. Got to be careful what you wish for. Yeah, exactly, man. And I've kind of learned to kind of pace myself. You know, I got to yeah. get, I got to give myself some rest. You know, I used to just go, go, go. And then, then you're not having any fun. And, and sometimes you got to, you just got to go, go, go. But you know, if, you, if I can get a little bit of rest between hunts, you know, a week or so, I, I just hunt better. Yep. Yeah. I think that's true. I had a really big takeaway on this recent elk hunt and I did a little post about it, but around day five, it was like getting towards the end of the day. And I noticed a lot of really negative self-talk and not like the normal stuff, like really dark. And I'm not that guy. Like I'm pretty, you know, confident, assured. And even when stuff's tough, I can stick it out. And I was like, it finally hit me. I'm like, this is just, this is not me, man. I don't know who's talking in my head, but it's not me. And I started doing the math about how much I was sleeping every night. And on these early season hunts, like you have like 16, 17 hours of daylight and you want to catch the early morning rush and you want to be out there at dusk. And I was sleeping like four, four and a half hours every night in the back of the truck. And I realized I'm just underslept, man. Yep, that's and it. it's doing my head in. And I let myself sleep in three hours the next day. And it was like my whole worldview changed. Like I felt a million times better. And it was like, it's great to push, but you get to a point where there's diminishing returns. And I think the older I get, I just turned 45, the older I get, the better I am at recognizing that like work smarter, not harder kind of line. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I think, you know, as a younger hunter, you think it's all about push, 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 hardcore, hardcore, the more hardcore I'm going to be, the better I'm going to be. I kind of learned too, that that's not always the case. And, and, and anybody that's at a high level in any sport, you know, they, they, they know when to push hard. They know when to back off and you just, you just nailed a big one that's sleep. And, you yeah. know, I'm still at 54 years old, I'm still an eight hours a night sleep guy, yep. you know, and, and you go hunting, like you said, you got those long days in the early season. It is hard to get enough sleep. Yeah. And I, and I've learned, you know, push, but if, if things are slowing down, you know, cause not every day is a great hunting day, yep. man, I'll take the evening off. I'll be just like, I'm, I'm going to rest. I'm going to go to bed early, man. Some hunts I'll go to bed. A couple years ago, I was hunting in Nevada. Dude, I was going to bed at like seven o'clock at night, six yeah. 30, seven o'clock at night. Um, and it was just because the evenings were not, not panning out. I was ending up so far from camp, you know, getting back. And then I'd be a little late in the morning, you know, and then I'm, I'm like, well, the mornings are the best right now. Just the moon phase and everything we were in, the mornings are the best. And so, I don't know. I've just kind of learned that too. And I heard Randy Ulmer, you know, one of our best bow hunters talking about it. He's like, it's okay to take a night off. My gosh, yeah. you know, you're, you're out there killing yourself. You're not going to be that sharp. And so, um, sometimes I think we beat ourselves up too much. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. Just finished this. This is oh man, thank you. This has got to be required reading for all new hunters. Like I tend to get a lot of people listening. Like I kind of came into hunting list later, so I think you know most of the people who listen to my podcast are the same way. And I think more important than like the technical how to stuff, the first half of the book with like the history and the philosophy of like why you do what you do. Like I wish I could can that for some of the younger hunters because I find that it's lacking and I don't want to do this cheesy like what's your why but I kind of mm-hmm. do like I, I do find that that's lacking to some degree and I, I just did this podcast with Cody Rich about how to become a consistent hunter and like yep. it was always a goal for me like I wanted to be that guy who could fill the freezer every fall no matter what like no excuses no it was dry or it was a bad winter like I could go out and for me I wanted to be able to consistently kill an archery elk every single year and just you know, I just finally did that two years in a row. So that was a really big yeah. step for me as far as my development as a hunter goes. And your your why in here about, you know, being, you know, limiting yourself selectively to hunting big mule deer and being able to walk away on small. Like, I, I just find this whole process fascinating. And I want to, 
I want to read a little clip and then I want to ask you a question. So okay. that was the buck that started it all for me. It changed the trajectory of my life. I knew that day, Lord willing, I'd spend my life pursuing big mule deer. Here and now, the fire still burns. Now, you are an excellent mule deer hunter. Nobody is going to dispute that. But I actually think your greater talent, after having read the book, is your ability to make very difficult decisions, like clear the fog and then stay committed to the plan of action. And you kind of detail that in several steps. But I would love you to walk through because in hindsight, it seems like an easy thing to do. Oh, I'm just going to hunt big mule deer and that's all I'm going to do. I don't know if people recognize like the sacrifice and what you had to give up. Like, how were you able to actually come to that decision? And then how did you stick to it? Because there's got to be distractions clawing at you all the time, you know, while you're trying to stay consistent to such a clear goal. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you for reading the book, Jay. I've been on a lot of podcasts and a lot of hosts don't take the time to read the book. So I, I kind of have to do the drive in here. So it's great when you're pulling stuff out of there that we can talk about because it'll help us keep, uh, keep, keep the focus. Um, hopefully you picked up in the book that I just love mule deer hunting. I love the entire process of mule deer hunting and hunting for big mule deer extends that process. You know, uh, yeah, I could go get a buck on opening day a lot of years. A lot of guys could. But then it's over. Yeah. And back when I was a multi-season or multi-species hunter, elk, deer, turkeys, bear, I mean, I did it all. That was fine. In fact, you kind of wanted that to happen. Like, yeah, I need, I need to get this hunt over so I can get on to the next one. But I took a hard look that I'm doing fine on the rest of these. You know, I'm getting an archery elk almost every year. I'm, I'm getting bears. I was kind of getting into the steelhead game, love steelhead fishing. And, um, but I was never doing very well on big mule deer. Right. And I grew up in a, in, in, with a father that just, just loved big mule deer as much as I do. And that's what he kind of always coached me as is, Oh, if you want to get big deer, you got to get serious about big deer. If you just want to get one in your life, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. You know, you can dabble in it and, you know, maybe you'll get one in 30 years. Well, I just didn't want that. <laughs> and so I just decided, I think, that chapter you just read right there, I wrote that when I was 27. I think I had been hunting six years prior to that chapter, just fully dedicated on mule deer, almost hunting no other species, and just throwing myself into that. And and that's, that, that chapter you read right there, the one that started it all, that was the culmination of that six years of focus and just saying, okay, yeah, I could go elk hunting every year. Yeah, I could go do these other things. Um but I'm going to throw myself at mule deer and do the best that I can. And, and it paid off with that buck in that chapter. I've still never beat that buck in, in 30 years of hunting. That was written 28 years ago and still, still have never beat that buck. And um, so I got to taste it. I got to enjoy it. And, and, and it's still driving me on. It's still driving me on. I know we opened the podcast with, oh, man, I'm kind of tired right now. You know, coming between hunts. And that's because I hunted like 17 days during archery season. I get a week off. We get a roll into the next one. Blessings, just as you said. It is. But. You know, it, it takes that kind of focus to do it. And, and, and then as I got older, I got married. I'm very happily married. Got three kids. Um, I, I just had, I had to, I had to get even uber focused on, on mule deer if I was going to continue to do well. And, uh, so that, that's the journey that I'm still on. And, and I love it, Jay. I love it. And, um, if it wasn't for the love of mule deer and the love of the process, couldn't hang with it long enough to get a big one. That's really what it gets down to. And I've been really tested the last couple of years. I don't know if you saw that film we released through Rock Slide this spring, uh, uh, yeah. the slump, breaking the slump. You know, that was three years due to that fill and a tag. That has not happened since I was a young man. And and now we get this hard winter on top of us. <laughs> I'm halfway through the season. We might be starting a new slump, and which sucks. But but I still love it. And, and, I, and if I don't get a buck this year, I'm going to end the year with a smile. I'm going to thank the good Lord for the days that I got because I truly still do love the process. And even though I'm tired, I'm thinking, man, I wish, wish opening day a rifle was another week. I wish I had one more week, you know, get to a few more of my daughter's soccer games, see my wife some more, catch up at work. My goodness, work's a mess, dude. You, sh you should see my desk. It's just terrible. You know, hiding from the boss. Yeah, I'll, I'll catch up on that next week, I promise. But it's the love of mule deer that's like, no, no, I'm, I'm headed out next Monday morning. It opens Tuesday. I'm packing in. We're going. We're going to give it, give it all we got. It's the love of mule deer that keeps me pushing like that. 
So you made a comment in there that I find very interesting. And I think most people would assume with your, you know, resume, you don't feel pressure to produce anymore. Like you're known as Robbie Denning, the, you know, giant mule deal killer. When you have a span of three years, do you feel that pressure? Like we live in this age of social media. You're one of the founders of Rock Slide. You're kind of right in the big mix of it. Does that start to prey on you? And are you ever in a, do you, do you feel like the commitment starting to slip and it's like, well, man, I should at least just fill a tag or like, what's that mental game like for you? Yep. I have to push back against it. I, f- I feel all that stuff, you know, and every time I, you know, j- jump on the forum and jump in our mule deer forum and somebody's just put, got, got another good buck, you know, archery season, that's always a stinger for me. I'm not a very good archer. I love, love to get another big buck with my bow and I'm seeing guys do that. Yeah. I feel all that pressure, man. You open Instagram, Usually I open Instagram. The first one I see is Mindful Hunter, man. So I give you a like, and then I move on to the next one. And th- but it's th- I see these guys posting these big deer, and I'm like, oh, man, I, of course I want him. Of course I, f- I feel all that pressure. Right. But I shouldn't even use the word pressure because I've, 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 I've dealt with it long enough that I know that I'm human. Of course I'm going to feel that. But that's not what it's all about. That is not what it's all about. So I do push back against that, Jay. And that three-year slump I just went through, that was good for me. That really was, man. And it's, you know, hunting, hunting is, you know, I got a relationship with the Lord, hunting spiritual to me. And I said it at the end of that film, you know, I, th- I, thank, I thank God for the trials too. The trials are what make us better. And I can't just take the good and not take the bad. Yeah. And sometimes you're not going to get one. So that three years, it was a test and it was a good test. It made me a better hunter. And it really made me examine what I was saying just before before this was that, do I really love this? Right, do I really right. love the process? And I was able to answer that question with, yes, I, I do. Even if I don't get one, yeah. if I never get another one, I still love it. And I'm, and I'm still going to keep pushing. You know, for me, like I tried a bunch of stuff kind of growing up and trying to find myself as a man, as a husband, as a father. I did jujitsu, CrossFit, all kinds of stuff. And when I found hunt hunting and specifically backcountry hunting because my background being a forestry engineer and all the rest of it for me it kind of brought it brought together the mental the physical the spiritual like all these things that could challenge me at the same time and i, I it most stuff in life comes easy to me i'm not going to be i'm going to be honest and not that it comes easy but i've always been very good at figuring out systems mm-hmm. and it's like what's the quickest way to learn how to do this i execute my system i usually have pretty good success and hunting was one of those things that just kicked my butt uh you know it took me 5 years to get my first um uh elk with a bow um, Archery elk. took me 7 years to get my first bow in british columbia cuz my first one i got down in new mexico and i like for me, it's almost like the greater the challenge, the greater the reward. And I do feel like a little bit of that gets lost too. Like I've been having frustrations lately and I need to know to call my feed because I see these celebrity guys go out and they take people out for their first time and they get them an elk and everybody's, you know, shaking hands and I'm stuff. And I'm like, you just robbed them of like what this is actually about. Like it wasn't about putting that animal on the ground. It was about seeing what you were made of and, and how hard you were willing to push and how far you were willing to go to achieve this. And when I see people that don't get the opportunity to go through that, I, it's not like I get mad at them for their success. It's almost like I get sad for what they missed out on because that's what I think is actually like formed me more as a man. It's been the failures back and forth and it's been the consistent challenges. And that's kind of what I hear coming from you mm-hmm. about yep. this three-year gap as well. Yep. That's exactly right, man. If it's, if it's easy, everybody would do it. And, um, for me, it was, cause really, even though I just went through a three-year slump, that chapter you just read, that was after a six-year slump. Yeah. Um, cause I didn't take any big bucks in that time, but that's, that's when I, that's when I, that's when I learned, I loved it. I learned more about the, about the pursuit, all those things. Um, yeah, I had, I had to go through that. And yeah, if somebody goes out and we all say that somebody gets a big, a, a kid gets a great big buck, you know, first time out, we're like, well, you're ruined. You know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but I know what people mean when they say that is, wow, you just, <laughs> you just got to hit the fast forward button through like five years worth of stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
you do a really good job at focusing on something I don't hear a lot of other people focusing on. And it's something that that I had to learn as well. But it's the idea that you learned very early on that you were going to have to add more field days per year if you were to to do this. Because like most people who do that eight to 10 day trip once every fall, like again, you might luck out and get something, but you're not going to consistently produce. And I'd yeah. like you to discuss like the importance of adding more field days to the calendar and from like a principal approach, the types of things you did and the types of things you still do to, to allow, because it's not like you've, you're not a single guy, your faith is very important, your family is very important, like you're still doing other stuff as well, but you found a way to create more time for this passion. Yeah. And, and some of it's just out of necessity. Like I told you, you know, when I was hunting multi-species, I mean, I enjoyed all that stuff. I really did. I enjoyed elk hunting, all those things. And, um, but I was just not doing very well at getting big mule deer. And so I, 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 I pur- purposefully focused on it. And as I did, a lot of that stuff just had to go away. And we, and then when I got married, you know, I talked about that a little bit in the book. I mean, I, I really, I mean, you know, I want to have a great marriage. And, you know, I didn't want my wife playing second fiddle to deer hunting. And so the more focus I put into it, the better that I got. And, but, and, and yeah, Jay, I would love it to, you know, I usually have, a, you know, two, maybe three mule deer tags a year. Oh, I'd be, I've done it enough now. It's okay with me if I just go get one after day three on each one, you know, that'd still be nine days a year. Um, but it takes more than that. It, it, for me, it has it for me, it has, you know, I'm not getting great tags most of the time. I'm, you know, I'm just a regular guy. I'm not buying high dollar tags, not saying I never would if I had the money there and it didn't impact my family, but it's, I said it in the book takes, takes me 25 to 40 days to kill a big mule deer. Now that's when I wrote that book in 2014, that slump I just went through, I had 120 days to kill one big buck. Now, hopefully that's behind me now. But it just takes that many days. That's what I'm trying to get at here, Jay. It yeah. takes that many days for a DIY hunter to to capitalize on that. And, and and I'll be the first to say it. I'm not the most efficient hunter. You know, there's I, I'm not. You know, for the, sometimes I look at my buddies that you know they'll spend less days and do just as well. I, I don't know why they just do. Um, you know, they have they have less days between big bucks than I do. Uh, so maybe I don't have it all figured out. But it, it just takes that many days, you know, 25 to 40 days a year. And for many, many years, up until three years ago, I was getting a big buck every year. And, and so that was the formula. That was the formula. 25 to 40 days. I would love to shrink that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd be okay with 20 days. You know what I mean? That's yeah. still a lot of hunting. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. I want to read one more quick thing. And I promise I won't do this the whole podcast, but this one stuck out to me and it it actually, you're, you're, you're discussing this in reference to a particular skill, but I think the principle of it um, is, is more important. So, <clears throat> those thousands of days spent in deer country have taught me one important lesson. A human moving at normal pace is completely foreign to the rhythm of the forest. Mule deer, the most keen of animals, can pick us out like a tuba in the rose parade. And I thought to myself... This is really interesting because I've felt this before. Like I feel when I fall into the rhythm and I feel when I'm out of sync. Yeah. And my thing tends to be these 10, 12 day hunts. And it's like normally it takes two or three days at the beginning. And I normally start to slip around day nine or 10 because I start getting so anxious that there's not something dead that I'm like in my own head. And yeah. it's almost like that pulls me back out of it. But I'd like you to talk about that rhythm of the forest. Like, what is that for you and what types of things have you found that work for you to help you? And for people who aren't, who haven't read the book, you're specifically talking about still hunting at this point, but I think it's more important than that. I think it manifests itself as a technique in still hunting, but I think it's something we can apply across the entirety of a hunt. You can. And for every species, um, mule deer have the biggest ears in the forest. If you look at them. So we, you know, we know they're, they're, they're you know, audibly, you know, that's one of their best defenses and their noses are right up there too. Um, I am ADHD uh, diagnosed, um, and I've always been just a fast mover. You know, even as a little kid, driving my teachers crazy. You know, I was I was that I was that kid, and um, I look at ADD, ADHD as a gift now that I'm older because I can get a lot done. You know, uh, but what you read in the book was 
particularly stuck out to me that I, I am so foreign to the rhythm of the forest. I move fast. I talk fast. I walk fast. I'm choppy. You know, uh, I mean, sometimes when I'm around my wife, she's like backing up, you know, like, ah, <laughs> calm your hands down, honey. You're just talking. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah I guess I am. And, and as I hunted big deer more, you know, my daddy, he told me, you know, don't step on the stick. You know, this is how you move through the forest. But that was so foreign yeah. to my personality. And I had so much to overcome and still do. But many of my successes came when I overcame that and I slowed down. I got, you said, it, the rhythm of the forest too, like you said, takes you two or three days. And for me, it's not even, a, it's not like a switch. It's not like I just walked in the forest and say, okay, calm stealth mode now. No, sometimes I just can't even get into it. I'm a human. I mean, you know, work follows me into the field. You know, that's why I hate phones. I hate hunting where there's cell phone service. You know, I'm doing this. What's going on at work? You know, I have 25 employees. Oh, I can't let this go. I got to help this guy. And, 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 and that bleeds over in, 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 into how I hunt and how I move. And the more time I spent around mule deer, especially big mule deer and old does are no different. You can't get away with hardly anything. And just the rate I'm moving my hand right now for your viewers, because that's too fast. If you're within a hundred yards of a deer, that's too much movement. Yeah. Now you might get away with this. And then the, 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 the noise that we make, and I'm talking, you know, most of the time we go in the forest, we're thinking, you know, don't talk, whisper, you know, don't, don't, don't clank your binoculars against your gun. Oh, definitely all that. But the squishing of your arms, if you're moving too fast, creates a noise that they can pick up. So what I'm trying to get at is that if, if, if a person goes into a mule deer's world you are so foreign to that that you got to do everything you can to become part of part of that environment. And I'm talking, you know, typically sound and sight here, yeah. but you know, we've got to pay attention to the wind and everything. And I just don't think we appreciate that. And I know as a young man, I didn't appreciate it. I just thought it was, you know, glass them up, stalk them, you know, be quiet. But so many got away in that kind of red zone, you know, maybe with a bow, that's the last 50 yards. Maybe with the rifle, it's the last 150. So many of them got away, just dumb mistakes that I made, Jay. Um, I, I had an episode on, on our podcast on Rockside just a couple of weeks ago, Archery Mule Deer Hunts. And I talked about, you know, stalking a buck to his bed. He got up, moved out the bottom of the dry. He's like 150 yards away. I had to sneak back to my boots and I wasn't real careful. And, I, and, I, and that buck got out of his bed and moved out of the canyon. I think he heard me putting my boots on. I think he heard me over there rustling and, you know, and I'm not just throwing them on and stomping my feet. I mean, but I wasn't being as careful as I should. Yeah. So with that thousands of days, I told you I spent in Mule Deer country. I wrote that. I wrote that eight years ago. It's more magnified now because I've been reminded again and again and again that, man, you cannot get away with much. You really can't. And so the more that we can slow down and be calm and mindful uh, of what we're doing, the better you're going to do on average. You really are. It's very seldom a game of speed and power and um, strength. It's it's th Those things are important, maybe in the logistics of mule deer hunting. But when it comes to living with them and overcoming their senses, the tortoise wins the race. Right. Yeah, man, that, that lands home for me. I, I tend I tend to spend way too much time moving, um, and I just I equate you know effort with probability of success. And sometimes the mm -hmm. thing that requires the most effort is just to sit down and and sit still. You know. Okay, uh, let we, me add something real quick. Please, to that, Jay. Please. There, there's another chapter there. Uh, you read the one about still hunting. There's one about ambush hunting. Yes. And and if you if if you pay close attention in there, I talked about that. I with, with ambush hunting, I'm talking about you know just reading the sign, not necessarily seeing the deer and saying, hey, a deer could come through this saddle or this funnel or this hillside based on what I've seen in the past or tracks on the ground or you know whatever. So so so, so you sit in that place quietly, with the wind in your favor and with your silhouette blocked and some bucks that's the only way that you can kill them they're so keen on what's going on and and, and what i was going to say is in, in in that technique of ambush hunting that's one of those nine techniques that i see new hunters no skills whatsoever have killed some giant bucks 
because they go into the forest. They don't even know what to do. They don't even have binoculars. Right. So they sit down and they be quiet and they watch. And more than I can even remember, 10, 15 times over my life, I, I've seen had guys bring bucks to my house or I see them in the local buck contest and I just get talking to them. And you know, this dude doesn't know anything about mule deer. And he killed a bigger deer than I killed in 10 years. And a lot of times it was just sitting and being quiet because he is now the rhythm of the forest. Right. That that's what that's where I was trying to go with all that. Yep. No, I I love it, man. It's great. Okay, I want to pivot to talk about some more tactics. And I think everybody does a the focus these days is in the backcountry. It's very you know, romantic yes. that, you know, right. it's like, it's, uh, it's great for pictures and content and, and everything else. But so I'm about to head to, and we're going to use up a hunt I've got coming up as an example, cause I'm, I'm selfish and I'm, I'm going to get Robbie Denning to give me some free advice. But so I'm going to Colorado for the first time, second rifle mule deer. I did a moderate amount of what you would call the big picture research before kind of mm-hmm. picking my unit. But as I've happened before, it's almost like there's this thing called confirmation bias. We seek out information that supports a conclusion we've already come sure. to. So when I think I found a good unit, for some reason, my brain only finds the information that like supports that choice that I found a good sure. unit. Sure, sure. And after I dig into it a bit more, I realize, okay, it's like pretty run of the mill and, you know, average. And probably more of what we would call like front country than back country. Now, there still is quite a bit of back country, but the other thing I come to realize is this time of year, probably not where the mule deer are going to be. Maybe where the elk are going to be, but the mule deer are probably going to be coming down and a little bit lower. And just, so I've tried to, uh, you know, you, you, you even talk about two of the biggest bucks you ever took in your life or within, I think half a mile of a, of a road or something like that. But again, mm-hmm. more on this mm-hmm. front country. So from a, like a, a tactic perspective, and let's start at the, the e-scouting phase, what types of things are you looking for or trying to focus on when you're in that type of a situation where you're probably going to be day hunting from the truck, maybe a little bit of sk- a spike camping, but you're not going to be going deep and employing those kind of tactics. Gotcha. So, um, second season this year, dates matter. They always matter. Second season this year in Colorado opens October 28th. Yep. And um, you said something a second ago. I want to clarify, make sure I understood you. Were you saying in this area that you're hunting, the deer have, are going to have already passed through the area and all that's going to be there is elk, or you're saying the deer are going to be arriving in the area? Okay. Again, so this is just on some of the initial research I did, and I'd love to, you for, to question any of these assumptions, but like the higher stuff in this unit tends to be around 11 and a half. It's not a crazy unit with like 13, 14,000 stuff. And when I started my scouting, I had thought I was targeting that highest of areas, trying to catch them in the Alpine. And then some people I've had some phone calls and emails with said, probably by the end of October, those deers are going to be moving down a little bit lower. You may be more interested in the eight to nine stuff. And when I started looking at that stuff, I realized, oh, now I'm like bordering private and I'm like, I'm coming down the hill a little bit closer to town. And so that's yeah. where I started focusing a little bit yeah. more of my pre-scouting energy. You got it. Um, but this is what I've learned in 30 years on and off hunt in Colorado. If there's snow in the high country, you know, mo- more than a skiff, three, four inches or more in the high country, 11,000 and up, 90% of the deer are going to be below 10,000 feet and below. Um, there's always going to be a pocket of one over here on this 11, five peak. And he's up there with the hardiest does in the unit. And, you know, they're, but that's not the deer I go after because it, it's still a numbers game, you know, unless I just have a hot tip from an elk hunter. Hey, I just saw a great big buck right up there. Then I ignore the elevation. I don't care. But if, if I'm going to, to the unit and, and, and I'm getting into later October, we could have a very dry fall. could be very mild down there. And if it is, there's no snow in the high country, de- definitely. They're not going to be right out in the Alpine J, you know, the above timberline stuff. You know, by, by then they've typically pulled to the timberline um, and, and they're into where there's, by that time, their, their, their gut has changed where they're fo- focusing on woody brows a lot more than they are the grasses. And so they can't just go to the timberline and have one plant type, which is, you know, Douglas fir and subalpine and, you know, all that other stuff. They're typically going to go to 
where it's what I call the aspen conifer zone, where they're starting to get into a mix of you know multiple plant types, where the, maybe there wasn't very many deer there even two weeks ago, but by that time of the year, you know they're, 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 that's the kind of food that they're looking for. And so there's always a zone, an elevation zone. You know, it's never just just one. But for for everything that you were saying a second ago with the people that have reached out to you, I think I think they're shooting you straight in that. You're going to be in that probably eight to 10,000 foot. They said nine, but so if they know the area specifically, that's your small picture research. That's your, that's your golden ticket, right? You know, that's, that's, that's the, that's the ticket into the chocolate factory right there. You got somebody you trust. It's like, yes, dude, right, right here. That's what I mean. But the difference between big picture and small picture. So definitely focus on that. If they're giving you exact spots where, Hey, we've seen deer during this date range, you know, plus or minus five days, man, that, 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 that's the process right there. You're going to check that one morning, check that one, one evening. Goodness, there are deer here, man. I'm going to give it another morning. Um, you know, also not three days, all I'm seeing is does here and small bucks. We've got light weather. There's not really a push of new deer coming in. I, I better, I better move. I better go to another spot. But what you saw in that spot, because it's an elevation zone, is probably going to be applicable applicable to the next place that you go. Okay. So for me in Colorado, I'm always second, third season. I'm hunting the brush zone. If you look really close at that buck that I killed in that film, look at all the brush that he's in. That was where all the big bucks were that I saw last year and you know and again you, you, you'll get the wild story of hey fred just killed one on his four-wheeler back here at eleven thousand feet uh, okay i'll note that you know but I, I i don't let it usually change my my plan much okay nice. because with with it opening on october 28th jay you're getting into the rut whether you're observing it or not those those fawns have to be born right around the 10th of june Fifth to the fifteenth is the bell curve. You know that's when the a healthy deer herd in the in the northern Rockies, the central Rockies, the high elevation stuff. That's when their babies have to be born because if they're born later than that, which is what a lot of hunters think, because they're like, well, the rut's not happening; it's delayed. Well, the rut's happening. This is sex here, people. It's happening. I promise you. It's just dry weather. You know, not a lot of snow. They're not on their feet during daylight hours. They're just doing more of it at night, so we're not observing it. But that starts to kick in roughly, depends a little bit on moon phase. But by the 28th, bucks are breeding does. Now, you may only catch them around the does at first and last light. That's typically what I see around those dates. I got to get kind of more to the 3rd, 4th, 5th of November and still have decently chilly weather to see daytime activity of rutting, but I still hunt second season as a doe hunter, meaning I'm, I'm what are the does doing? I'm really keying in on that. Now I, I don't, I don't pay attention to the easy does. Any self-respecting buck doesn't usually go to the easy does. And what I mean by the, the easy does is the, the ones that are very observable. Everybody can see them. They're, they're, they're close to roaded areas. Um, any buck that got around those gets killed. All right. So, so I'm talking about, I've always used the term secure does. I'm looking for does that are, that are not so easily bothered that a buck could be breeding them. And I think even though he may not spending the day, the day with them, he's not far away. So there has to be bedding cover around there. And those are the does I really pay attention to. And if, 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 if I've got a good thing going on a season like that, Jay, I typically know where two or three different doe groups are in secure areas, which may, may mean I need to ignore three other doe do groups that are not in secure areas. And then I'm, I'm making sure that I'm getting the, the, the first half hour to hour of light and about the same at the end of the day around those areas. All right. Unless I've just seen something else that I need to go check on that. That's, that's where I put my eggs in that basket right there. And so that, and, and, and you'll find when you do that, those does are those secure does. It's almost always brushy Aspen, uh, Oak brush is big in Colorado. It's, I think that's where the, most of the big bucks are on second, third season is in the Oak brush zone, uh, Aspen Oak zone. And, but that all sounds easy on a podcast. When you get there, it's like, Oh my gosh, that's like an ocean of brush. Right. Yep. It is. It is. And then that's, but at least you've got it narrowed down. Now there are does here. And you, you may spend three days just figuring out the glassing points and how to get to them without getting winded. And again, without sounding like a bull moose moving through that stuff, you know, like, yeah, there's does right there. 
but I don't have any way to get over there without spooking them. Cause once you spook them, they leave, they're not scared anymore. The buck's not going to come around. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so yeah. that's slowing things way down compared to me when I was 23 and man, I'm on, I'm on a different knob every two hours, you know, cause and, 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 and scattering scent and you know, wind and, and noise all through that country and spooking deer that I never even saw. I didn't even know we're there. I mean, we, we do a lot of that stuff in that kind of country. And so, um, but that the advice that those people are giving you, especially if it's specific to that unit, that is where I would start. That is exactly where I would start. In fact, that big buck I killed last year, that wasn't just a me effort. That was listening to locals and yeah. people, people's advice. And even though I didn't, they didn't, they didn't draw an X on the map. In fact, I didn't even kill it where, where these guys had, had talked about hunting, but it was the same type of country. Right. Aspen, oak, steep, not super remote, you know, two miles in, something like that, you know, and, and not, not 10 miles in. There was no deer 10 miles in. There, there's typically not um, because by that time of year, they've, they've moved. You know, Colorado, the, 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 those are some of the most migrational deer in the West, you know, because they've got such a, a broad elevation they can live at. You know, they, they, they winter at 6,000 feet and they summer at 12. Just think of that, you know. And so there, there's a lot you got to get in there and, 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 and ferret out and figure out where they're at. But, but tracks don't lie. And even if it's warm and dry and I'm not seeing them during the day, man, I'm looking at the ground. And, and you know, I'm not talking about, oh, well, there's a big buck track. I'm going to follow him into the trees. I mean, I will if I find one like that. But usually I'm just I'm just reading the sign like, man, there's a lot of deer in this this one mile of road. I saw 45 deer tracks cross this mile of road right here. Where are they going? What's going on? Are these old? Are these just last night? Um, you know, maybe we came out the night before and the next morning going, man, every 50 yards, there's two or three deer going across this. Where are they going? I'll back up and look at that country. And, and, and one more thing you had mentioned that then when you got looking at it, it's kind of around the private and everything. Yeah. That's just the way Colorado was homesteaded. You know, right. people, people couldn't make a they living up, on up that there either. Feet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, all those valleys and everything ended up, you know, being bought and things like that, but there's still a lot of public land and that's where Onyx has changed everything. And in a way to me, it's, you know, a lot of guys say, oh, it's just ruined hunting. I'm like, no, we used to all be on the same road looking at the same deer yeah. because we had this big flat map and it was like, well, is, is that private over there? And, you know, you go ask the landowner, he tells you everything's private because yeah. you don't have any way to know. And the fences aren't on the boundaries. So there was no confidence where now it's like, oh, yeah, I don't care if there's a cabin right there. That guy only owns the 25 yards behind his house. The rest is landlocked national forest. I'm going. And, yeah, maybe there's two other guys there. But 25 years ago, Jay, there was nobody there except for that landowner and his friends. And those, those us three or four guys, we were, we were back on all the same forest road looking at each other, trying to figure out where to go. So there's, there's two things there that I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into. The first thing is the tracking, and you mentioned the importance of this in the book, and you do a good job sharing some information about tracking. Are there any other resources you would recommend for people who want to learn more about that? Or is this one of those things that you really just got to spend some time in the field and kind of like, oh, when I see this, that means that, and kind of put things together? Um, I mentioned two books that inside my book. They're both written by Tom Brown Jr., um, I recommend people read those books. Um, and he gets way into track. I mean, this dude tracks bugs, right. you know, um, and he gets into the whole metaphysical, spiritual side of it. And, and you know, that's all good. He kind of loses me in that. But but what I learned from those books, and, and this is kind of his catchphrase, tracking is just awareness. That's all it is. And that sounds so basic, but I well, the old me, and then I see hunters every single year. Well, what's a track? I mean, yeah, I saw tracks. What do I do with it? You know, I mean, there, there's no awareness there. Tracks speak volumes to what is going on. If I could rewrite that book, I think I went a little too heavy in the book of like tracking an individual buck's tracks and there he is, shoot him. That doesn't happen very often. To me, tracking... It, is the whole awareness of what's going on around me. So I just talked about if I was in Colorado and I drove that road and there's 40 deer across this road in this one square mile or this one mile of road. And then the next five miles, two deer have crossed. I got to go back there and figure out what's going on there. That's all I mean by awareness. And Tom Brown Jr. is really good at, at giving people that awareness. And that second book he wrote called uh, 
the art and science of tracking. You only need to read about the first three chapters. After that, he just loses you. Um, and, and it's stuff you, you, you probably really don't even, you know, you're not going to be tracking any bugs, so you're probably going to be fine. And this dude's tracking people in New York City on dry sidewalks, you know, stuff like that. Um, uh, so there's a lot there that, that, that you don't need. And, and a lot of people have said he's all hocus pocus. Well, maybe he is, but boy, you look at, look, I mean, he's been involved with police departments, you know, searches for missing persons and everything. You know, the, the, dude, the dude's got some, some, some legitimate, um, uh, a legitimate resume when it comes to tracking. And, and he's more than a hunter. He's not just a hunter. Uh, my dad was watching a movie the other night with Tommy Lee Jones in it, and I saw it was something about a fugitive that got away. And and in the credits, it had it, it had Tom Brown Jr. in the credits as one of the one of the um, film advisors. And okay. I know what it was because the, 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 this film. I wish I could remember remember what it was. I'm pretty sure it's um, the fugitive with Harrison. Ford. Dude, I think it is. I yeah. think it is. Yeah, I didn't even get to see the whole thing, but I but I walked in and my dad was watching. He's like, "Hey, did you check this out?" I'm like, "Hey, that's that Tom Brown Jr." But anyways, the, the tracking is awareness. Tracking is awareness is what it is. And I think there's so many levels to what that awareness is that we're not paying attention to. There's a lifetime of learning right there. And and I don't want to make it sound like I mastered it. I, I haven't at all, but I've just learned to pay attention to tracks. And I'm so amazed when I go to a, to a unit sometimes and people are just glass, which is fine. That's your number one technique. But man, there's a whole story being told on the ground around them. And last year, you know, we'll keep talking about that book because that's my most recent one. The, 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 I didn't just go into that little place and kill that deer. I had been watching it from a distance for a couple days. I think I went in the day before, the day before that. I can't remember. And I, I just didn't really see that many deer. I saw a few. I saw one older buck. So I knew it was secure enough. I, I was seeing does, but I could never nail them down. It was like, well, there's a doe. Oh gosh, she went in the brush where she could, I could never sit back and watch them. But as I, as I paid attention to the ground, I'm like, there are pretty much deer everywhere back here. I mean, I'm seeing right. buck tracks. I'm seeing doe tracks, fawn tracks, even though this is really thick country. I think if you could just lift the trees up, there would be hundreds of deer right here. Right. And, and, and yet you go back there and spend a half a day and you see four, you know, but it was tracks that told me that. And I didn't ever see that buck's tracks before I killed him, um, uh, but it was the tracks in the area that led me to keep hunting there, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, the other thing I find interesting is your approach to like a daily schedule. And I think maybe for some newer hunters, that's something else that they're, that they find challenging. Like how long should I sit here in glass and yeah. how can I be most effective during the different parts of the day? Mm -hmm. And kind of what I took away from reading the book and kind of planning out this second rifle hunt is that like, okay, the best times of the day to be glassing is going to be that early morning. And then as I'm losing my light going into the early evening and the middle of the day could be better spent either finding where those locations are for the next morning and something you just mentioned, potentially finding even walking routes and like, what are the best glassing knobs and stuff like that. But how do you tend to approach you're, and obviously, as soon as things start to happen, you know, we adapt and we overcome and things change. But in an ideal world, what does your daily schedule look like on? And, and, and this sounds like your hunt last year is not dissimilar from the one I'm preparing for. So what did an average day look like on that hunt? Um, I make sure that I do not miss the first minutes of light. Um, I used to think sunrise was early. Sunrise is late. That is, that is like, I miss the bus if it's sunrise, you know, I, so much has happened in the 40 minutes prior to that. And I make sure I don't miss that at all costs. That one's a non-negotiable unless I'm just fogged in or something like that. That's a non-negotiable. And I will give up the entire rest of the day to make sure I'm in prime areas at that time. Okay. So. Having said that, I take a nap almost every day. Now, it might not be back at camp, but a lot of days it is. Because in order for me to get to where I need to be, I mean, I, I'm not talking about just being out in the deer country 40 minutes before light. No, if I've done my job, talked about those secure doe groups, I want to be in that area, you know, glassing range, shooting range at that time and ready to rock and roll. Dude, that could be a two and a half hour process from the time I get out of bed you know, get some coffee in me, get some breakfast, 
You know, I eat breakfast every day. I don't want to be out there eight thirty in the morning thinking about food. Um, so, man, I got to get to bed early. I got to get up early. Um, a, a lot of these, these these hunts that you're talking about, they they occur after the after the time change um, uh, for us. Um, do you guys do daylight saving times? We DC? still do. They've talked about ditching it, but yes, as of it's kind of ridiculous. Still, as of now, we do it. Yeah. Okay, so so when daylight saving times happens in, in in late October, man, it gets dark early, doesn't it? Yeah, and it gets light early. Okay, that just used to just throw me off, you know, because it's all, suddenly I got to get up an hour earlier. But yeah. after 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 daylight saving times, dude, I'm getting up at three forty five, four forty five is late, yeah. you know, and sunrise is at seven thirty by then or something like that, and so the reason I'm going into all that, I got him. I'm still an eight hour sleep guy. I got, I can't be getting run down. Yeah. You know, you talked about it. I, I, I think I even watched your reel. You were talking about, you know, yeah. getting down just negative and everything. Dude, that's a hunt killer, isn't it? Totally. Absolute hunt killer. So if, if I'm doing that two or three days in a row, getting up like that, dude, I'm going to be tired and I do not sweat it to go back to camp and burn an afternoon, take a good nap. You know, my dad taught me this, build a fire, make a good dinner, something, get recharged. Okay. Now, most days I'm back out in the evening. Definitely. You know, when the sun's, you know, three quarters down the Western sky, that time of year, you know, once the, once you go into daylight savings, it's literally like three 30 or four o'clock. It's, you know, it's pretty early. Um, you know, this time of year it'd be like seven o'clock, but, um, the days are so short then. So I make sure I'm out then, but I'm not usually killing myself in the evening. Evening is kind of more recon. Now I, I don't hunt. I bet out of my 25 or 40 days a year that I hunt, I bet only three or four days. Do I actually hunt all day of those? Okay. Um, I'm going to hunt all day when it makes sense to hunt all day. So this is when it makes sense to hunt all day. May, may, maybe one of those mornings, man, I saw him. Dude, he's right down there. I, I just didn't get a shot at him. The does are still here. He, I didn't spook him. The only other guys that are here, they're two ridges over. Man, I'm, I'm here for the day. I'm, I, I'm not just going to leave that buck, um, especially if there's a reason for him to stay there. Okay? So, so a day like that, I may stay on that buck all day, and I've killed about 30% of my bucks in the evening. That buck on the cover of that book that you just held up, that was an evening buck based on recon I did during the previous days, but I didn't hunt him all day. I just had recon. There was does in the area, went there earlier in the evening, hiked in, ran into another buck. He was actually pretty nice. Let him go. Um, ran into another guy, um, starting to get into the fading, fading light, like sun's down, you know, you're, you're sun's down for 10 minutes and you know how dark it gets, how fast it gets. Yeah. And, and that's when I saw him. And that was based on recon I had done during the day. But, you know, I think that was the fourth day of the hunt that year. I'll bet I'd taken that two of the four days that of that hunt, you know, cause, cause again, I'm up so early. So I put all my eggs in the basket of the morning, rarely if ever miss a morning. And then evenings, um, our, our, our follow-up on the morning. If I've seen something, what, I mean, if I've seen something that was good, I stay there all day, but that doesn't happen very often or following back up on things I've seen, you know, that morning, like, Hey, there was, there was doe movement here or, Hey, I did see a lot of tracks in the area, even though I don't know where the buck is, I'm going to come back here tonight, not here tonight, you know? And, and, and that may just be setting up an ambush. I might just be sitting my back against a tree overlooking a, you know, a, 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 a small oak brush basin with one open hillside, maybe not even that much glass in country. A lot of times where I kill these bucks, it's really tight, Jay. And, and, and you can't, you can't glass very far anyways. I mean, I, I, I that time of year, I mean, I'll have a small spotting scope. I don't have a big glass with me. And if I'm in the truck, I do, but you know, if I'm out on foot or even on the horse, you know, I, I don't have a, the big eyes with me because typically where those bucks are, they're in tight places anyways. You know, you might see them from three miles back, but you can't see them anywhere in between that three miles and a hundred yards. Right. You follow me? Yep, and so yep. a lot of times that that's how I'm doing it. But Jay, I'm, I'm probably a lot lower key than, 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 than guys realize, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a wuss when it comes to sleep and I've just learned, man, if I get freaking tired, I just like that little reel that you made. What was that? Like a month ago you did that? Yeah, yeah. I that was right in the middle of that, that archery hunt. Yeah. Yeah. People should go look at that because there were some truth bombs coming out of that. You were raw and you, yeah. you were, you were saying how it is. I'm like, yeah, that's what happens when I get tired. I just hate it. I'm not having fun anymore. And for me to have to, to love this process, I got to have a little bit of fun. Yeah. So, so a lot of days I'm just resting in the middle of the day and that maybe that's just an hour. 
I mean, so sometimes just being back at camp an hour or two, you, you know, you recharge. Sometimes you can't make it back to camp. You know, I'll just kick back on a sunny hillside, eat a sandwich, you know, snooze a little bit, whatever it takes. Um, but I'm, I'm always reacting to what's going on that day. And that's why I said, hey, yeah, I'll hunt all day. And if I saw a buck that morning, I didn't get him. And I'm not going to walk away from him. No way. Um, snow snow days and rut days i'll hunt all day a lot of times when it's snowing and rut just because the deer are active all day my friend kurt donner always said this he goes i like to match the deer if the deer are up i'm up if the deer are down i'm down that's how that's how he always said just an old deer hunter if the deer are up i'm up if the deer are down i'm down and and that was just a generality but i thought you know he's right because once they're down especially in this heavy brushy country unless you got rut or snow or something to get them up what are you going to do you're just going to spook them walking around in there yeah you know, it's funny. His book is impossible to buy, by the way. I know. You can't even find it. You can't find it anywhere. And I thought I had it, and then it didn't show up for six months, and they just refunded my money. But a good friend of mine whose podcast, I believe you were on just a little while ago, uh, Kevin, he runs the, yeah, the Focus yeah. Kevin Toy. podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And he's an, he's another guy who's just an absolute stud. But um, uh, yeah, I he, he greatly intrigues me, and I really wanted to read that book. Now, we're talking about glassing. And you prefer a technique that's kind of, I don't want to say a little bit different from like my standard approach. And it's kind of got me second guessing things. Do you still choose to run a pair of like smaller chest binos, like an eight or something, and then have a bigger pair of binos that are primarily for tripod use in the pack? Absolutely, dude. And um, we release an episode on Monday on the rock cast, listen to it. And if you don't listen to the whole thing, just listen to the first 20 minutes. And I recap my, uh, archery season that just ended. And I talk about that. Um, even though I don't mention the exact specs on the binos, but I finally found that buck. I lost the third day of the archery season this year. When I say lost, I didn't hit him. I didn't even shoot at him. I just spooked him and he, I found him after three and a half weeks. And I found him at four days to hunt the last four days of the season. The first three days I did all the screwing around outside the area that he had been in making sure he's not in these outside surrounding areas and then the last day i set up with a pair of big, big eyes and what i meant by that was 15s and I, I just say in the episode it's big eyes but i said 15s i set up with a pair of 15s about a mile and a half back from the most likely place i thought he could show up and um caught him at daylight finally saw him after three and a half weeks the, those binoculars got left in the truck and then i when i went around the mountain um Um, I was only hunting with my chest binoculars. So I don't do it any different than what I said in that book there. The big eyes are for when I'm sitting and, and actually have something to glass, you know, I need big eyes, 15 power, the new BTXs are 32 power. Um, you, you know, I need, I need country in that three quarters of a mile out to five mile. I need to justify those because they're all heavy. But when I'm on, on my feet, I, I, I've got, just my chest binos and then i'll have a spotter in my pack and right now it's the swarovski um atc their new smaller spotter yep. but prior to this year i ran a nikon ed just that little nikon ed yep. um and i got swore when i got all this stuff but a lot of times I was on my feet all i need a little spotter for when i'm hunting in tight like on this hunt that we've been talking about with you you know i'm not glassing out on some big mesa here you know three miles i'm no i'm looking yep. down in that little draw and man is that a buck down there i mean i just need to be able to I just need to be able to identify them. So I'm pretty lightweight. My pack is small. I don't run a big pack. I still run a small Nimrod day pack for, for my day hunts and everything. And, um, um, and I will put my 15s in there. If I have a destination, I'm going up this drainage and there is a little ridge at the top of the drainage here. I can tie the horse down below, or maybe I'm hiking and I can hike up there and I can sit for two hours. It's worth the wait. I, I definitely take them. So it's all very, very uh, methodical and thought out. I'm just not willy nilly keeping my 15s with me all the time. Or my, have you seen a BTX, how big they are? No, but I've looked at the weights of them. Yeah, they're ridiculous. Yeah. They, they really are. They're ridiculous. So they're a very specialized tool. You know, I used to pour concrete and we had a sledgehammer that was like a six pounder and that we use that one all the time. But then we had like a 14 pounder on yeah, the yeah, truck. Yeah. It hardly ever got used. Yeah. But when you needed it, you needed it. You know, that's how a BTX is. So I have even packed my BTX in the backcountry, but it's because I have this one place where I can see two basins that are uh, one's a mile away, one's a mile and a half away. And then there's another one over there that's three miles away. This is going to be worth it. So right. I'll, I'll do that then. 
But to the very beginning of your question, I'm still packing eights on my chest. Now, do I remember that you did a little review or you had something to say about the Zeiss SFLs? Because mm-hmm. while people are hitting me up left and right wanting a review on this. And I thought to myself, maybe a pair of these eight SFLs would be the ticket. What was your take on those? Um, those are in my truck all the time. They're, they're the binocular. That, 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 that They didn't convert me to tens, but for 25 years, I used seven and eight power binoculars only. And then when we paired up with Zeiss a couple of years ago, and the first ones I did was their SF. That's their small one, their 8SF. Yeah. And they sent me the 8SF and they sent me the 10SF. So it was kind of a Zeiss head to head. And um, I decided I liked the 10s for scouting. Binoculars have come a long ways in the last 25 years. 10 power binoculars used to have such a crappy field of view. Yeah. Field of view is the most underutilized spec, I think, in an optic. Everybody talks about power and resolution, all important stuff, but field of view. You know, the field of view on a 10 power binocular used to be like looking through a toilet paper tube. Right. And so eights were just better. Well, when Zeiss sent me those SFs, they, they had a big field of view for a 10. And so I thought, you know what? I will run these for scouting because I don't need it. I, I, I don't run a dedicated rangefinder, Jay. It's this whole rhythm of the forest thing. I run a yep. combo binocular rangefinder. So then I can just do this rather than this. You know what I mean? Yep. Two of them. Totally. So um, I, I, when they sent me those, they were so good. Um, um, I, I sent them back the eights and I kept the tens just for scouting. Then the next year they came out with the SFLs. They don't have as good of, uh, and they were a 10 by 40. Those others were uh, a 10 by 32. They came out with a 10 by 40 SFL and um, it's not as good a resolution, uh, but it's still a very light frame. You know, 20 years ago, they would have been called a compact binocular. We call them, kind of call them a semi-compact. Um, they're, they're a small frame binocular. I think they weigh 23 ounces, something like that. Um, big field of view in the tens and they're tripod adaptable. So I can put them on a tripod quarter 20. And, uh, so those, those binoculars are in my truck. 24 seven. They stay in there all the time. They're, they're a great truck binocular. Not that I wouldn't hunt with them. I actually scout with them when I don't need a range finder. Okay. 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 Yep. So they get a lot of time in the summer, but now they're just sitting in the truck and I use them from the truck and they've got a great field of view. I, I would highly recommend them, Jay. And if you want to try a set, just let me know, man, I'll send, I'll send you mine. I'll be done with them here in about a month. And, um, uh, and, and you can check them out there. They, they, they are the testament of how far optics have come in the last 10 or 15 years, you got full size binocular performance, like the best that Zeiss used to offer, you know, and they're like seven by 42s, like 20 years ago, you can get them now in a 10 by 40, as good a fill of you, better resolution, better edge to edge, Dude, 23 ounces compared to, you know, 38 ounce binoculars. It's a, they, they were this long, you know, they yeah. hang them around your neck. They go from your chin to your sternum, you know, where now you don't even hardly know they're there. Yeah. No, that's great. I do think, because my buddies, I've been lucky enough to hunt coos deer in Arizona a couple times, and my coos deer mm-hmm. buddies, the, the holy grail is the 15 SLC. Like, you yep. will not, and it's funny that Swaro discontinued those now, because there's going to be a bunch of really choked coos deer hunters in Arizona, because that's what they're all running. Plus, they're, they're just hiking up hills from their truck. Like, they don't have to take them in the backcountry. Um mm-hmm. Right. And they, they swear by those things. And then they have a smaller pair of, of chest binos. I've also been thinking it from a, an archery perspective, because especially when you're only one handing it, the handshake in the tens and twelves get to be a little bit much to like really get much. a firm picture of what's going yep. on. So having a smaller pair of chest binos that you could hold up with one hand and still have a nice steady picture in, um, is really attractive. And I do think the clarity in the eights and tens have come so far that you don't need to be looking through like a pair of 12s every day. Either. Yeah. I would never use a pair of 12s as a handheld binoculars. There's just too much shake. And when I said I'm using tens now for scouting, it's because scouting, I'm not still hunting. Um, and so I, I, I typically have more time to sit down, brace myself. And now with the little tens, I can put them on tripod, but um, where the eights I'm on my feet a lot. And, and so I, I, I don't get to, I don't, I don't get to sit down as much. And, um, the, the shake is for real. Yeah. And I notice it in the tens in the summer when I very first start using, them, I'm like, wow, these are really shaky. It takes me a little bit of time to get used to them yeah. where when you put an eight up, you know, it's, it, 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 it's just a lot less movement. And so that's why I have both eights and tens, I guess is what I'm saying. But remember all, most of those bucks killed in that book that you have right there. They were killed with seven power binoculars. 
I love field of view, that. brother. I'm telling you, field of view. You see a lot of bucks in that bigger field of view. How are you doing for time, Robbie? I, I don't want to keep you too long, but I got a couple IG questions that people are going to get choked at Let's me do I it, man. I love IG questions. Okay, perfect. Let me grab these here. Yeah, people were excited. Sometimes I get people on, and you get a handful. I got more than a handful with with you. All right, let's hit them. Uh, people say what they want about Instagram, man. I meet a lot of cool people on there. Uh, yeah, Dude... I think it's like anything in life. It's a tool. It's a hammer. You can build a house with it or you can crack somebody over the head with it. Like how you use it is up to you, you know? And I think if you're intentional about it, I think there's a lot of positive to come from it. But I, you know, I'm not going to, you know, be naive and say it doesn't have its negative impacts as well. But I think if you take responsibility for your own experience, it can be very positive. Um, this is something you do a lot of coverage on, which I really respect. And we haven't talked about it at all, but, um, Ty asks, how do we stop the slow, dismal decline of mule deer that is happening? Oh, man. Join the Mule Deer Foundation is the first thing you need to do. As soon as you get off this podcast, they have a $35, might be $40 a year membership. Okay. You get a good magazine four times a year. The magazine is just chock full of good, not just grip and grins, yep. uh, biology, the history of mule deer, how they're doing in different parts of the countries. At the back, they have like... Uh, like a regional wide wrap up and, and you can go through and I mean, they have like a mule deer coordinator in each state and like, you know, how are mule deer doing in your state and what are you guys doing? Oh man, we planted, you know, hundred thousand acres of the bitter brush and the, just outside of Santa Fe, you know, we've seen mule deer increase, you know, 20% on this plot, you know, whatever, just all kinds of good stuff like that. And it, it's just good. It's just good to know that stuff. There's, you know, hunting, hunting big mule deer is, is learning about all mule deer. And so that magazine is totally worth it. I, I'm behind about the, on the last issue. I need to jump in there. I think it's still sitting in the plastic, but I always come away from that magazine more educated because it's not just a hunting magazine. So that's, that's the first thing that we need to do. And, um, we talk about this a lot on the Rockcast. I'm not a big limited quota guy because when you go to limited quota stuff, something always has to give, and that's hunter numbers. You know, people you have to exclude people, and I, I want that to be the last thing that we do because we need hunter numbers to. I don't know if you follow follow Hal.org. You guys yep. lost your grizzly bear hunts and everything up there. This is coming, people. You know, we got to have strong hunter numbers to to fight against the antis. And the antis are more organized than they've ever been. They've got more power than they've ever have, and 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 they're coming for our hunting. And so, um, um, I, I I realize limited quota hunting can make for more more bucks. It really can because that's typically what we hunt. But it's not going to reverse the the decline in, in mule deer populations that seem to be more related to habitat, human encroachment, things like that. And that's why I keep going back to the mule deer foundation because they spend millions a year, uh, rehabilitating habitat, acquiring habitat. Um, that's huge. <coughs> and what I mean by that is if, if a piece of habitat is valuable to mule deer and the mule deer foundation or some su subsidiary group that supports um, conservation can secure that and keep it from getting developed. That's huge. We just did this right outside of Vail, Colorado for Bighorn Sheep this week. Um, did, they, uh, many organizations, did they secure the funding? We, I knew we they were got looking it. for it. Yeah, okay. yeah, we got it. We got it. That was a so, big deal. Yep. And now it's on to some, the next challenge, but at least people stood up and cared enough to say, hey, we don't, don't, you can build the golf course down there or mm -hmm. whatever they were trying to build. I don't even remember what's condos or something. Um, you know, this is a sensitive piece of habitat. Dude, and it wasn't even that big. I donated to it. I, I gave them money. But, and when I read it, I'm like, wow, that's a small chunk of property. But, yeah. you know, the West is shrinking. We need to defend those. And I'm lucky to live right outside of a, a large um, a, a winter range owned by our fish and game. Either they own it or they're in partnerships with landowners to give them incentives and things like that. And th conserving all of that is, and that's one of our best mule deer herds right here because, you know, they've got winter range that they can go to. Right. So conserving all that is, is all we can do to stop the long, slow decline of mule deer. This is almost an entire podcast episode. Yeah. So great question to him, but join the mule deer foundation and keep buying licenses. Remember our licenses are supporting our, our game and fish, get involved with our game and fish departments, make sure that they're, I mean, I think they are, but you know, make sure there's some oversight that, Hey, what are we doing? for the future of mule deer, not, not just selling mule deer tags. Yeah. Love it. Um, I'll put a link to, to the mule deer. I'm going to write that down. Hang on. 
Awesome. Yeah, Mule Deer Foundation. I'll put a link in the show notes too. Um, okay, so a lot of the guys I deal with are dealing with a limited budget. And so this is, I think this is a very good tactical question. If you had a limited budget, what would you buy first? A 65 millimeter spotter or 15s? Spotter. Okay. The That's spotter. funny. I thought you were going to go the other way. I'm not, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, you're talking to a guy that lived on a limited budget for many, but that book, I mean, I, dude, I was so poor when I wrote that book, you know, I raised three kids, single income family. Um, uh, you know, my wife stayed at home. Um, she did a lot of good things, but you know, I was, I was, I was the one hooked up to the wagon every day. Still am love every minute of it, but I had to live my life on, on being focused and frugal. And, um, the 15s came later. I never had a good pair of 15s until about the time I wrote that. I mean, maybe like a year ahead of that or something, maybe 10 years I've been running them. Um, and a pair of eights on the chest and uh, a good 65 millimeter spotter, you know, kind of, you know, Vortex Razor, Maven and up yeah. in that. That's going to be the your most utility right there. Fifteens are great, and you can see more when you look through both eyes. That's how God God gave us two eyes, not one. Yeah. But if if I have, and, and right now I, I still do that. I talked about it just a second ago when we were talking about how to approach areas. I yep. said um, sometimes I'll leave all that stuff in the truck, and I just take a spotter and I just take a bino because that's the most utility that I'm going to have. Okay, right. So that that's what I would start with, and then and then maybe just pick up a pair of less expensive 15s vortex had that um I, I did a review on them jay it's been quite a few years ago and they were pretty good they they didn't have the greatest eye relief and so you get um that 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 that, 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 that uh, vignette the, yeah. the 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 darkening pretty easy if you didn't hold your your face but once i got used to them they were pretty good they were 400 bucks um gosh they're probably out there used for 250 now um and I got by for a few years with those two before I could jump up into the SLCs and even the even the Kaibab, even the Vortex Kaibabs, which used out there, you should be able to land those for five or six hundred bucks for a good pair. Um, you know, you you could jump into those in a year or two pretty easy if if you if you went used. But definitely a spotter and a pair of chest binos. You pick. I go with eights, but you can totally justify tens. Okay, love it. Can you pattern a mature mule deer buck during the rut? like year after year? Um, we get so little rut hunting opportunity now, unless you can just draw the tags. And, you know, the, the, the draw hunts, this is another reason I'm not a big limited quota guy because I've seen how bad the, the draw odds have got over the years here. I mean, great, yeah, draw, the draw, have, have a great limited quota and I'm going to hunt once before I die. That's kind of where our rut hunts almost are now, Jay. They really yeah. are. And so I don't, I, I've hunted the rut a lot over the years, but because tags are hard to get, I don't, I don't get to stack a lot of years consecutively. And that's really the, the, what the question is, yep. is, you know, you, um, and so I know you can, and, um, it's been done. And, 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 and the, the, one of the biggest bucks to roam the West in the last 25 years was Popeye's on the, on the cover of Mike Eastman's book. The, that buck showed up on the winter range to rut November 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th, something like that. But over the five years they watched him, he was always in the same place on those days. Okay. Crazy. And, um, so I know it, 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 it happens. I know all things being equal with the weather and everything that it happens. And th this is what I would do with it. If, if, if I had a rut tag, I would talk to as many people I had that had the rut tag the year before. And if somebody knew there was a big buck, I would find out what date they saw him on and what conditions they saw him in. And if they were so nice to give me all that small picture information, I would, I would plan five days right around that date. Okay. and check that um one of the best bucks killed around idaho falls was in 2015 and they aged him at 12 years old it's a giant buck um uh um six and a half seven inch bases giant buck jay um that guy had scouted that buck the year before i think on the same day like so say it was november 28th um and and i think he was just out scouting maybe he was hunting with friends but he didn't have a tag and um Maybe somebody picks up his sheds in the area. The next year he went back and he looked, he killed that buck on that same day or within a day or two within, within the same draw. So it, it is possible. You just got to have the opportunity to do it, right. but right. I'm not going to put all my eggs in that one basket. I'm not going to just sit in that canyon, wait for that one buck. That's a mystery. And, and, and I've seen this happen during the rut. I, um, uh, and this is on the year that you have it. If I see a big buck in the evening and I didn't get him, 
oh, I'm in for a couple of days. I'm oh. back there, maybe even longer, until something tells me he left. That big buck that I killed in 2016. Um, oh, that buck, right? You can see him just off of my shoulder right there. That buck in 2016 was killed on a rut hunt, and I found him on November 3rd, and I lost him. I saw him again on like the 6th, and then ended up killing him on the 7th. Okay. So that buck stayed in that area, that kind of one square mile area over that four or five days, but there were days I couldn't find him either. Right. Okay. So if that answers his questions, yes, they are patternable. It's just hard to string enough years together to say, hey, last year there was a big buck here. So this year there's going to be, hope yeah. that helps. No, that makes a lot of sense. If a pocket on a hillside is known to hold bucks, and I think that's the key here. Would you um, still hunt or ambush hunt the area? Ambush it. Okay. Still hunting is almost my last tool. Still hunting is hard, especially for somebody with ADD. Yeah. I, only, I only got about two or three hours that I can really slow down and focus. And after that, you know, my, my mind is just wandering. I'm not being quiet. You know, I'm, it, it's just not a zone I can stay in. Walt Prothero, the old mule deer hunter that wrote Mule Deer Quest, he talked about that too. Now, he was different. He, he, he could still hunt all day, but he said when he would go to bed, he was so tired, like more tired than on the days that he hiked a lot. So it takes a lot of focus and concentration, and you can screw a, you can screw a lot of stuff up when you're still hunting. And, and the, the shots are typically quick. Um, it, it, it's just hard to overcome all their senses and get a decent shot and shoot the right buck. Um, it's just a low productivity method, but it's in my book because I've still killed a few big bucks doing it when nothing else would work. Right. But if it's a pocket that's visible within rifle range and I can, I can still hunt or I can ambush, I'll pick ambush almost every time. The only time I won't is ambush hunting is cold if you're okay. later in the fall during the rifle seasons. And so sometimes you can't sit very long, but, but you're more stealthy ambush hunting every time. Okay. That buck I just mentioned that I'm over my shoulder here, yeah. I killed him on an ambush. Okay. Took four days of sitting there and I, and I finally got him. And it was just because it was an area, I mean, you could have still hunted it and maybe you could have even killed him, but I think you would have polluted it more. I, I think, I think I would have pushed him out. Um, this question comes from my buddy, Steve, who congratulations, Steve. He just took a really nice kind of 180 class buck. Um, oh, rare air there, south. buddy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, he holds out, man. He, he was like you, he took it on day nine, had to pass up uh, a lot of lesser bucks. Um, he is a, a true mule deer killer. He, um, yeah, he had some, he had some very controversial thoughts about, uh, uh, elk hunting versus mule deer hunting that were pretty comical the other oh, day. Oh, you should but. get this guy on the podcast. Yeah. I, can, uh, can you say who it is? His name's Steve Evans. I know exactly who it is. I saw your buck on Instagram. Told you Instagram is a great place. Good job, Steve. Way to yeah. go, buddy. Awesome. He would like to know what's the hardest buck you've ever worked for and actually got? The one in that chapter that, um, uh, I, that, that you read from is the one that the started it all. Yeah. Yeah. That buck. Yeah. Because, because it, it took six years and I had hunted him for two years and I think I'd hunted him 16 days total before I yeah. killed him. I can't think of a harder one than and that, 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 that's still my biggest buck. 234 official Boone and Crockett, uh, gross 227 net. Um, it was a gift from God. I don't think I'll ever get a bigger one. I love it, man. What advice would you give younger Robbie? He says 30, but I want to say 25. I think you probably knew too much by the time you were 30. <laughs> slow down. Yeah. Slow down. Just slow down. Yeah. And I'm not just talking, I'm mostly talking to the ADD, Robbie, but to all of us. Slow down. You saw I wrote a whole chapter in that book, Jay, yep. called Moving in Deer Country. That's not even really a technique. It's just think about how we move in deer country. I'm so glad you brought that up about, about that. That's one of the most important chapters in there because of just how foreign we are to the rhythm of the forest slow down. Um, it's not about the miles. It's about, the, it's about the quality of your intent of hunting. That's got me far more bucks than just pure physical effort. So the physical effort's going to come. I promise you're, you're going to get your butt kicked. You're going to have to do that kind of stuff. But back when that was all I did, knob to knob to knob, you know, new drainage every day. I didn't do as well as 
you know, my older body now that's slow and I got to be careful. I got a hurt knee. I got to be careful. I, well, buck hunting's tougher now. So it's, 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 it's hard to compare apples to apples. Right. But the me right now, if I could go back to 92 to 2004, before these winters just really started kicking our butts, I should say 2007, I probably have 40% more big bucks than I have now because I've screwed up so many of them. And I still am. Just in the last couple of years, I've screwed a couple up, but I screwed up a whole bunch, right. a whole bunch of giants I let get away that I think now, and, and I'm, I don't want to pump my tires or brag or anything. I just, I would have got them now. I would have got more of them. I would have got more of them. Slow down. Okay. So this next question is about BC in particular. So we are incredibly fortunate. I think we probably have some of the most opportunity on the planet. You'd be hard pressed. I mean, I can show you how many tags I got in my pocket. It's wild. However, uh, we do not have the density of animals that a lot of the Western states have. And uh, I don't think people really, you know, understand how spread out some of the animals are here. So this guy's question specifically says... Do any of the tactics that you talk about in your books change when you're in super low density areas in BC? But I almost think a, a better example is, or a better question would be, when you know you're dealing with an area that has a low density population, is there anything you do differently or is it still just the same stuff at maybe a different pace or or, or how would you approach that? Um, there's not enough to that question the part that's missing is what type of country is it is it okay is is it is it densely forested heavy cover country or is it open country it's still a great question but i want to add that to it because i've hunted right up to the canadian border took one of my best bucks just south south of uj yep. um so I've, I've got to hunt in what we call the boreal forest Yep. And, um, I, 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 I know what he means. Like I could go a whole day and not see a deer track. You talked about tough. it in Montana too, that, that one hunt you, you talk in the book. I think you went nine days or something with, was his name Tyler or Trevor? Ty, Trevor. Trevor. And you went, you went nine days and the first buck you'd really seen was that, was that one that you finally took. That's kind of what hunting here there you is, go, buddy. is like. Yeah. That's why I throw that out. So that type of country, my tactic had to be tracking and still hunting. Right. You couldn't glass. There was no glassing opportunity. You, I didn't even, I don't, I think I took my spotting scope out one time on a seven or eight day hunt, whatever we were there. So, so to answer his question, it's going to depend on the type of country in a country like that. The, all we did was, was move around every day, new drainages, looking for tracks, looking for deer sign, looking for rubs. And then when we found that, we narrowed that down and we still hunted those areas. You couldn't even really ambush hunt the areas. I mean, you didn't even know really, there was nowhere to really sit and see anything. But if it was more open country, like this archery hunt that I just got off of, and I, and I still think that's, those are low deer densities. I mean, there's just some of those places, there's only three or four deer per square mile. Um, but it's open country. Right. Big eyes, man. BTX, 15 SLCs, 80 millimeter spotters. I, I'm going to just spend more time on that. And it's going to be what you and I talked about a little earlier in this episode. That first 40 minutes of the day is gold. That's the only way I refound that buck. Um, he was in the cover by 810. Sun comes up at 730 here. And um, uh, and, and he was gone. I mean, that, it's so a, a lot more glass. And, and I'm, I'm still going to pay attention to tracks and everything. But, you know, I, I can I, when there's open country, that's, you want to take advantage of that. Your eyeballs can do so much work in open country. A lot of times, the, the hardest part, the hardest effort I'm putting forth is just finding a place to see and then finding another angle to see from. That's where all my logistics are going into. Do I go up that road? Do I hike up here? Do I saddle a horse and go to the top? It's not like that Montana hunt that we just talked about where, hey, the tracks are here. This is where we're going to spend our day. It's just more about trying to see deer. Love it. Listen, Robbie, that is, this is fantastic, man. I couldn't be more fired up for my, for my mule deer hunt. This All has right, been buddy. Amazing. Um, take a minute and let people know what's going on. Rock slide, the rock cast, all that kind of stuff. Where can people kind of follow what you got going on and what do you got coming up? Okay. I'm the, I'm the co-owner of rock slide. Um, big, big forum on there. We try to keep a clean forum. We try to get rid of the trolls. It's a good place to post a tons of gear talk. 
Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of half my, half my full-time job right there. Um, I, I ran the blog on there for years. I have over 300 mule deer articles on the rock slide blog. It's just called the rock blog. You'll see it on the top banner there. Um, and then we, we had a podcast, uh, ran by Jordan Budd up until a year ago. And then she's, she's moved on. Um, she's with meat eater now doing some different things. Um, we shopped around for, uh, for a host. We, Jay Nichols was busy, so um, uh, <laughs> we couldn't find the guy we were looking for, and so I ended up taking that over. But it was great; I had a couple other guys that stepped that stepped up, and it wasn't that I didn't want a podcast; it was just time. You know, every minute of my life is scheduled, and I, I, I can't imagine the amount of work you put into Jay to regularly post your podcast, dude. My hats off to you, bro. I know how Thank hard you, you're sir. working there, especially with your YouTube presence and everything. That is not easy to do. Well, luckily, I had a couple guys step up. Travis Hobbs, one of the best buck hunters around here. He's a co-host. Sam Weaver does our Tipsy Tuesday. So, you know, anybody's looking for for that type of stuff, it's um, I, I do all the mule deer stuff. Travis backs me up with it. We talk a lot about mule deer biology, um, you know, hunting in the West, things like that. Sam kind of covers the gear angle, things like that. So you can follow us on there. And then, of course, I'm on Instagram under Robbie Denning or Rockslide. Fantastic. I'll put, for everybody listening, I'll put links to all that stuff in the show notes so that it's easier to find. And a quick reminder, uh, go join the Mule Deer Foundation if you're going to do take an I'm not going to do it right now as soon as we get off this as soon as we get off this podcast. Do it, Jay. And if you're ever able to get to Salt Lake in February, they have a huge convention down here in Salt Lake. Man, it okay. would be great. A guy like you that's in the industry, you should come down, bring your podcast gear. Gear, dude, it is podcast fodder. There's so many people to yeah. talk to there. You love gear. You're great at reviews. All, uh, all the top manufacturers are there. You know, they'll, they'll jump on your podcast. You know, you could get a good BC presence down there for the guys that haven't come down. It's not that far. You can fly right into Salt Lake. Highly recommend it. That's a big fundraiser for the Mule Deer Foundation. Okay. It's a great event. We go every year. Would love to see you there. Any of your listeners, really, really, if, if there's only one show that you can get to, um, I, I think it's the best public show that's out there. Um, um, it's not just for outfitters and stuff like. That. There's a lot of uh, a lot of public stuff going on there. Um, you can draw one of 200 uh, uh, Utah uh, tags that they offer. In my, bison goat all that stuff um uh, that, that, that that's a great way to support it too jay so we'd love love to see you there sometime too awesome i appreciate it and thank you again for the time robbie this has been uh educational and and just super enjoyable i really appreciate it man well thank you and dude i just want to give you kudos too man enjoy your content you're killing it buddy it was great to see you get that elk this year you got two in a row now man I so did. just keep stacking them you're doing all the right things i love to hear about your processes and and i think you couldn't have named your 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 brand anything better than mindful you're always thinking you're you're, you're thinking things through um and 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 man i just i just gotta hand it to you I, I love that energy thank you very much robbie greatly appreciate it you bet all right have a good one man later